And I'm supposed to summarize all that, am I? Hmm, it's going to be difficult. Look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, when somebody comes in with syncope, your initial approach has got to be, this is something bad, all right? So you don't necessarily have to do IVO2 monitor on everybody, depending on the circumstances, but you certainly should be thinking about it because what you're doing here is trying to pass out the many people who just have a vasovagal benign form of syncope from the few people who have something very bad. And so when you first see that patient, if they're stable, you've got time to do the most important thing, which is take a very thorough history. If they're unstable, then you have to get busy, IVO2 monitor, and start resuscitating them. And when it comes to syncope, there are two broad groups. There's the cardiovascular causes of syncope, which have a poor prognosis. And then there's all the other causes, which tend to have a good prognosis. So on your history, you're going to ask for things like, do you have chest pain? Do you have shortness of breath? Do you have palpitations? Do you have exertional syncope? Now, that's really important. Ex exertional syncope is basically bad, 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 bad. It's aortic stenosis. It's hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It's something like that. It's bad. Then you ask for neurological symptoms. Do they have new onset headache? Did they have a thunderclap headache, for example? Did they not able to move their arm or leg before they syncopized, for example? You start thinking about they've had a neurovascular event. And then bleeding. You're obviously going to ask about bleeding. And in terms of the physical exam, you're going to go look for bleeding. And in terms of quick tests you could do at the bedside, you can do an ultrasound. You can slap it on their belly. You can see if there's free blood. You can see if there's an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And you could do things, if you're sophisticated enough, like look for aortic stenosis, look for a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, look for right ventricular strain of pulmonary embolism, for example. And in terms of tests as a routine, what do you have to do as a routine? Well, I think EKG is a reasonable thing to do in all of these patients, looking for things like dysrhythmias, looking for ischemic changes, looking for prolonged QT, looking for a delta wave, looking for a Brugada pattern, looking for an Epsilon wave, looking for signs of right heart failure, looking for signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. And again, we suggest that you go watch our EKG in syncope video. Further tests past that, and maybe a hemoglobin, really are very, very selective and really depend on what you got out of your history. And so some people, as a routine, as a bare minimum, get an EKG, get a hemoglobin, and get a pregnancy test in somebody of childbearing age as the baseline, and then go off and do tests after that. Now, your management is directed by the results of that history, physical, and initial examination. For some patients, it's, I don't know, for some patients, it's, oh, I really think they've got a PE, and I'm going to have to start working them up down that algorithm, or I think they're having an MI, and I work them up down that algorithm. So it really comes down to disposition. Sick people obviously stay. Low-risk patients can go home. So what's a low-risk patient? That's somebody who's young, healthy, EKG normal, looks like on the physical exam, on the history, that it's just a vasovagal cause. There was no exertional component. That group of people can go home. The high-risk patients, they have to stay. Who's high-risk? People with exertional syncope, people with known or a real concern for acute coronary syndrome, people with valvular disease, as evidenced by their EKG, or you can hear it on uh, their exam, or you pick it up on ultrasound. People who have a history of ventricular arrhythmias, people who have an implantable cardiac device that didn't work and they syncopize, people with known CHF, or people with any of those concerning EKG findings. So high-risk is usually pretty easy. That intermediate risk... They're, they're not really the young person with nothing wrong with them. They're not really the older person or the person who clearly has something bad going on. But that group in the middle, well, there you might want to keep them for a while. You might want to watch them. You might do a couple of EKGs. You might want to put them into an intermediate uh, observation area. And remember that chest mnemonic. The chest mnemonic, or the San Francisco syncope rule, says, is there evidence of uh, cardiac failure? Is there evidence of a hemoglobin less than 30? Is there an abnormal EKG? Do they have shortness of breath? Do they have a systolic blood pressure less than 90? If they say yes to any of those things, then they're a fairly high-risk group. But remember, that is a blunt instrument. There's a lot of high-risk patients that say no to all those things. And the classic one is the kid with exertional syncope. They don't have congestive heart failure. They have a normal hematocrit. They may even have a normal EKG. No evidence of shortness of breath and a systolic blood pressure, which is completely fine for their age. But every time they run, they collapse because, you know, they've got hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or they've got aortic stenosis. And you do not want to miss that. The chest mnemonic is good as an overview, and it's good to sort of write on the chart in your low-risk patients. But it is not the only thing to use. It is a blunt instrument which misses specific subgroups. And the reason it misses specific subgroups is because these... Syncope studies were done in thousands of patients. But the diseases we're talking about here, which, uh, for example, again, the exertional syncope, might occur in one in 10,000 patients, one in 100,000 patients. So unless you do a truly enormous study, 
you're not going to pick up that select group of patients. We know it through more empiric evidence, but we know it very well, so don't forget it. <laughs>